This is a sermon from St. Paul's Church, Brookfield, Connecticut, transforming lives through Jesus. For more information, go to www.stpaulsbrookfield.com. How good it is to be together to hear the Word of God and to get direction from the Holy Spirit through the living Word. And because the Word is living, this means that God has a living message for you and for me this morning that is alive, fresh, delivered by the power of the Holy Spirit right now, we pray. We will never give up, and we will continue to pray. This is the promise that we have from our epistle this morning, and that's what we're going to look at, a reading from Hebrews, just as we looked at it last week. It continues today. This was written by an anonymous author to a Jewish Christian church in Rome. These were Jewish people that knew the Jewish religious system very well. They loved it. And yet they'd come to see Jesus as the Messiah. And so this writer has certain things he wants to say to them. And one very specific thing this writer is saying is this. It's a twofold message, actually. And it begins with lits, meaning this is not just for one person, it's for all of us. Lits, hold fast to our confession. That means stay with God, never give up. And let's approach the throne of grace with boldness. So if we put the message together for us this morning, I believe God is saying to us, don't give up. Together we'll continue to journey and pray. God knows you, God loves you, God knows we need help, and that's why God is our present help in any time, especially in times of trouble. And I pray that whatever we're going through right now, through that journey of life, that God will show us that he is ever with us, that he holds us, and he calls us to hold fast. Hey, Gordy. <laughs> Sorry, folks, we got a little interruption. Gordy's <laughs> waving to me from the back. Hi, Gordy. Never give up. Keep praying. So this morning, we'll look at how this works, how this takes part in our lives through the grace and mercy of our Savior. What does perseverance look like anyway? Allow me to offer us a secular example. Back in the 1950s, there was a woman named Florence Chadwick. She was a famous swimmer. She was the first woman ever to swim the English Channel both ways. And in 1951, on the 4th of July, she decided that she was going to swim from Catalina Island, 26 miles across the ocean to the coast of California. So she set out and she had some boats with her with walkie talkies keeping an eye on her, and it wasn't so much the distance that was going to be difficult for her, it was the fact that the waters were frigid and filled with sharks. So she swam. She swam for 15 hours, and while she was swimming, a heavy layer of fog came down to where she couldn't even really see the boats around her, let alone the coast. And at one point, she just gave up. They got her in the boat, and she discovered that she, at the point of giving up, was only a half a mile away from shore. And so while she was interviewed by the press, she said, I don't mean to make excuses, but you know, if I could have just seen the shore, I know I could have made it. So what did she do? In perseverance, she tried again. And this time, once again, the rescue boats were with her on their walkie-talkies, talking to each other, making sure she was okay. Thankfully, no sharks attacked her. But that fog came back, thicker than before. But she swam on and she eventually reached the coast. And not only did she reach the coast, but she beat the men's record by two hours. And so as Christians, we're often in a time of fog in this world. And the call of faith is to believe in that which is unseen, to have a conviction of things we can't see and the assurance of things hoped for, that's how this book of Hebrews defines faith in a different place. It essentially means that we keep going even though we can't see everything. And we don't go in our own strength. We have support. Chiefly from our great high priest, Jesus Christ, who is what? Praying for you and for me all the time. We'll see how this works as we look at this concept of holding fast to our confession of faith and going to the throne of grace with boldness. 
Now, for this audience receiving this letter, this letter to the Hebrews, they would have understood the Jewish sacrificial system that is in mind here in Jesus being described as the great high priest. On the Day of Atonement, the high priest would go into the temple, into the Holy of Holies, that inner sanctum that only the high priest was allowed to go into. The high priest would make sacrifice and take that blood and sprinkle it on something called the mercy seat on top of the Ark of the Covenant where they believe God dwelt. People stood outside in dread and terror. Would God accept their sacrifice for another year? They even tied a rope to the great high priest in case he collapsed dead, they could pull him out. Such was the fear of God. After the atonement was made and the priest came out, the people would breathe a collective sigh of relief. Thanks be to God, our sins are atoned for for another year. But that would continue year after year. And so what the writer of this letter is saying to the Jewish Christians is, everything has changed. As important as that system had been, we now have a great high priest in Jesus who has shed his own blood and sprinkled it for the world to all those who will receive him by faith and has taken that mercy seat out of that enclosed place and has opened it up for the world. Let's now approach the throne of grace with boldness, the writer says. An ancient throne was something that was a terrifying concept. You didn't just go to a king's throne with any request. You might not make it alive out of that experience. It's a radical idea to approach a throne of grace of Jesus, our great high priest and the king of kings with boldness. So let's talk about how this works for us. Now that the mercy seat has come down, now that Jesus, our great high priest, has ascended into the heavens, meaning he has filled the entire universe with his presence through the Holy Spirit. That means we can call upon him anywhere in any way. We don't have to go somewhere. We don't need a mediator. You can talk straight to God. Don't give up. Keep praying. God is here. Well, why do we go to the throne of grace with boldness? In a word, because we are weak. We need help. We all struggle. We're all dealing with various forms of fog. We're trying to make our way through. We want to get to that heavenly country, as the Bible calls it, that celestial coast, that other promised land someday. But do you know that land is here with us now? Heaven has come down through the Holy Spirit. So yes, as much as we're journeying toward a place, through the fog at times, the promise is that everything in heaven has come to us right now through the Holy Spirit. As we pray to God through our great high priest, Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit, I don't think we can even begin to imagine how earth-shaking and radical this would be to the Jewish mindset and even to the Gentile mindset, that all the riches of heaven, the storehouse of God's realm is available to the believer through the power of the Holy Spirit as we simply go to that throne of grace with boldness. That means that we go and we believe that God is good, that he has blessings for us, and that, yes, we're weak and he'll help us out. So that's why we go to the throne of grace with boldness. God wants to help us. God wants to rescue us in our time of need. God wants to give us strength for this journey we all go through together. So if that's the why, why do we go to the throne of grace? The other question might be, when do we go? Do we just go for an hour on Sunday morning together? Well, we do, but no. We're called to be people who pray without ceasing, meaning that we go to this throne of grace with boldness all the time and in all places. All throughout the week, God wants you to go to the throne of grace with boldness. That's the win. It's all the time. Not just for a little grace bump when you need some help. Not just to get a little more extra strength. No, Jesus knows our weakness. He calls us to be about that throne of grace all the time in our hearts. As people of constant prayer, which is simply a conversation with God. So that's why we go, and that's when we go. How do we go? Again, it's that conversation. Jesus has made a way 
through his shed blood, that we have the forgiveness of sins and we can go before God with any need we have. Here's an example. Imagine you're holding a toddler. You're just delighted that you're holding a toddler. Gordy back there was our perfect prop, by the way. <laughs> Is he available? Could I pick him up for a minute? I love this 1030 service because I can do things I can't do at 8 o'clock. Hey, big guy. So I got a picture of you on the day I baptized you. All right. So imagine you're in prayer with God. Okay. Look at Gordy. He's kind of looking around me. He's focused on you, not so much me. I don't care. I love it. Gordy may not speak with perfect grammar yet. Doesn't matter to me. I'm holding him. He's with me. This is how prayer is for us. Right? Yeah. You want to run back to daddy? God just wants to delight in us in his arms. God doesn't need us to have perfect prayers or to be completely focused on him all the time. He knows we're weak. He knows we need help. He just wants us to cry out to him with our needs. No matter how small it might seem, God cares. And so prayer is essentially like that walkie-talkie. Which brings us to what? What do we expect out of this prayer? Well, if prayer is like that walkie-talkie, it's the connection to that lifeline, that supply line to God who provides for our every need, as the Bible tells us. And the enemy of your soul wants to whisper things in your ear like, your prayers don't matter. God doesn't want to hear them. You've got such minor concerns compared to the concerns of the whole world around you. But we must rebuke that voice of that enemy and know that our great high priest loves us, knows our every need, and desires to be with us. We're told in the Bible that Jesus, as our great high priest, sat down. Again, from the Jewish mindset, the high priest never sat down. His work was never finished. But not so with Jesus. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty of God, which means it is finished. Our sins are atoned for once and forever. But that doesn't mean he's passive. Oh, no, he's active. He's praying for you all the time. He lives to intercede, we're told. He lives to pray for us, longing that we might turn to the Lord and bring before him our every need. Again, the invitation from this letter is let's in two places. Let's hold fast to the confession of our faith, meaning let's not give up. And let's approach the throne of grace with boldness. So as much as prayer is an individual experience, which it is, it's also collective. We offer together common prayer, common support, and that word help in our time of need, which is what we can expect from going to this throne of grace, is a word in the New Testament that only occurs two places. It occurs in our reading from Hebrews that Jesus will help us in our time of need. And it's also found in the Acts of the Apostles, interestingly enough, where the Apostle Paul's ship is facing potential trouble in the storm, and they help the ship by tying it with ropes or cords to hold it together so it won't come apart in the storm. And that's the nautical image that the writer to the Hebrews is using, that we're a mighty ship as the church, and that God is Surrounding us with cords of love that can never be broken. That's the help we have. That's the help we need as we go through the sea of challenge in our lives. As we press into the fog. As we come upon the rocks that would seek to break us apart. No, we're held together. We persevere, not in our own strength, but in the grace and the mercy of God. So it's not all up to us. So when I say, echoing the words of scripture this morning, don't give up. It's not going to be up to us anyway. The Lord has us. We're bound with those cords that can never be broken. Even in our weakness, there he is strong. The call for us is to simply go to that throne of grace with boldness, knowing we have every right to do it, that God loves us with an everlasting love and desires and promises to lead us to that promised land where we are headed together by his grace and mercy. And for now, we say to each other and before the Lord as witnesses, Lord, by your grace, we will never give up. 
and we will keep praying all to your glory. Amen.